good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining from uh, your various locations. On behalf of uh, <coughs> on behalf of International Ideas Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, I would like to welcome you all who have joined us this morning for the first webinar of the Democratic Development in Melanesia webinar series. 2023. We would also like to welcome our panelists and participants. As part of International Ideas Asia and the Pacific Regional Program Work Plan for 2023, these webinars aim to provide opportunities to citizens of the Melanesian region to take part in substantive discussions surrounding uh, democracy in Melanesia. It is also intended that through the webinars, citizens of Melanesian countries who participate may gain knowledge on the subject matter and on the experiences of other countries. This will in turn enhance debates on institutional and procedural improvements in their prospective democracies. The first webinar titled Perceptions of this Corruption in Fiji and Melanesian Anti-Corruption Mechanism is a continuation of the webinar series of 2022, where we covered Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu. Due to the elections in Fiji, we could not complete the Melanesian countries last year. We have some house rules for this webinar. The webinar will have two speakers who will deliver their presentation first, and then the audience will have 30 minutes after both the speakers have presented their questions. Audiences can use the raise hand feature to ask questions. The audience are reminded to keep their mic off during the webinar and only on it when asking questions. Also, audience can pose questions through the chat feature. Before we proceed any further, please note that the session is being recorded. We also have a disclaimer from International Idea. The statements, views, or opinions expressed in the presentation do not necessarily represent the institutional position of International Idea, its board of advisors, or its council of member states. Our first speaker for today is Dr. Joseph Beramu, hails from Sapsabu. He studied at the London South Bank University and holds, and USP, sorry, as well. He holds a Master in Science, Master in Philosophy and PhD degrees. He previously worked as a high school teacher and a USP lecturer before joining UNDP and UNICEF. He currently works as Executive Director at CLCP, Integrity PG, a CSO accredited to Transparency International. Dr. Baramu is married with two children. He likes writing poems and stories in his spare time. I'll give the floor to you, Dr. Baramu, uh, for your presentation. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Vikash. And thank you to all the listeners. Uh, I, I would like to uh, express my deep appreciation to International Idea uh, for um, uh, for hosting this uh, webinar. I will basically be talking about uh, the CPI uh, for Fiji and explain uh, uh, explain it also, uh, just a brief touch, uh, touching briefly on some Melanesian countries. And um, uh, I'm assuming that most of you already know about the CPI. Uh, it's uh, on our website, transparency.org, and uh, our YouTube channel, Transparency International, also has this. So I, I'm going to sh share uh, two uh, uh, slides. Um, I, I, uh, the first one uh, was prepared on January the 25th uh, when we launched the CPI for this year. So I'll very quickly go over that uh, before I go to the next one. Uh, the, question uh, the question people ask is, um, how did Fiji perform in the Corruption Perceptions Index for, for 2022? So can you get that? Uh, it just, because it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, the Corruption Perception Index uh, uh, results released on January the 31st, 2023. Uh, it showed that Fiji has not fared well. Its score has gone down from last year's figure of uh, 55. Uh, out of 100 to 53 out of 100 for this year. Uh, Fiji's ranking has also fallen from 45 out of 180 nations, uh, that's from last year, uh, to 49 out of 184 nations uh, this year. Uh, while a fall of two points, 
implying an increase in corruption might not seem to be statistically significant. Uh, it highlights the urgent need for civil society, uh, the business sector, the media, and all stakeholders to work together uh, with Fiji's anti-corruption agency, FIGEC, to curb uh, corruption. Now, for most of you um, who may not be aware, uh, Transparency National notes that uh, in the Corruption Perceptions Index, a country's score is the perceived level of public sector corruption on a scale of zero to 100, where zero means uh, highly corrupt and 100 means very clean. So a country's rank is its position relative to the other countries in the index. Uh, ranks can change merely if the number of countries included in the index changes. Uh, the rank is therefore not as important as the score in terms of indicating the level of uh, corruption in the, in the country. Uh, 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 I thought I might notice here that uh, this is quite an interesting case because uh, Fiji, uh, Fiji first appeared in the CPI in 2006, 2005 or 2006. And there was a lapse of 17 years, 16, 17 years, there was a lapse, there was no CPI. And, uh, and people were thinking when they were looking at the CPI, they were thinking that, uh, did this mean that uh, Fiji was corruption free? Uh, the fact that uh, Fiji was not listed in the CPI meant that there was not enough data available to accurately measure levels of corruption. And uh, uh, some of you may notice that uh, in Fiji, they don't release uh, certain data, uh, disaggregated data uh, of ethnic levels. And uh, uh, there was a point, I think, that uh, the, the, the director of uh, statistics uh, was removed. So uh, if the data is not going to the international um, bodies, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, all these bodies, uh, then they are not able to do the, the CPI for Fiji. Uh, so um, uh, the, the fact that the coalition government has taken over, after 16 years is quite reassuring uh, because that uh, means uh, that there won't be interference in the work of the Bureau of Statistics. For example, whenever statistics showed ethnic distribution and the true picture of poverty in the household income and expenditure survey, that was unflattering. Uh, it was sort of not released to the public. So these are the kinds of things that uh, affect the CPI because they need this data. Um, another question that we, uh, we get asked is, um, how come uh, we only we getting these good scores? Uh, like there's a lot of corrupt activities report, uh, reported, but uh, they're not being report, actually reported in the CPI score. How could this have happened? Uh, one of the reasons, of, a number of possible reasons for this is that corrupt, corrupt activities, not within the time frame of that year's CPI, would take a year or more to reflect in the data sources. And some positive developments in controlling public sector corruption might have been captured balancing out of these negative uh, 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 cases. Yeah? Okay, so those are, uh, are some of the things that need to be taken into account. Uh, and uh, one positive aspect of uh, this year's CPI score and ranking for Fiji is that a new government has come into power that is not authoritarian. And I'm given to understand that uh, uh, there's a bill in parliament uh, that will repeal the, the Media Act and allow for free speech yeah. and uh, assembly amongst other democratic rights. And uh, I think they're also going to uh, repeal uh, uh, a land bill, uh, Bill 17. Uh, uh, so all these things are with more democracy, uh, it will be reflected in the CPI. Uh, I might also explain here that the CPI is not just about corruption. Uh, if you saw the, 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 the video that uh, I, uh, International Idea played before I spoke, you'll notice that uh, 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 the CPI also covers a free media, freedom of speech and assembly, human rights, gender rights, and a country run on democ uh, dynamic democratic principles. And uh, I also stress here that indigenous rights are also important uh, in, in the equation. I shall now go on to the second slide that, that I have. Uh, the second slide. Uh, and uh, as they're putting it on screen, I want to say that uh, I'm concentrating only on Fiji and Melanesia, uh, because uh, um, most of the information on the CPI, you can easily get it on um, uh, on the uh, our, 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 our website, transparency.org website. Yeah. 
Let's slow down to Fiji. Going. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Let's go to Fiji and then. All right. Um, you notice that um, uh, our score was 53 out of 100, and we were ranked 49 out of 180. And in the previous um, explanation, I said that the rank was not as important as a score uh, because the rank, uh, the score was the most important aspect. And uh, for Fiji, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the score of last year was uh, 55, and this year was 53. And um, they, uh, they, uh, they just had about two uh, or three uh, data sources. Uh, uh, no, they have three. Uh, they, they had uh, from Global Insights, uh, that's one source. The right is of democracy, another source, and the World Bank. That's the other source of uh, of the data that we have. Um, I'm not going into how they do the calculations. If you have any questions on this, um, it, it's in our website. Uh, the explanation. If you look at our ranking uh, with other Malaysian countries, uh, we uh, this year we are ranked. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, our rank was 49. Our score was 53. Uh, Vanuatu was ranked 60, and the score was 48. Uh, the Solomons was ranked 77, and the score uh, was out of 100. And PNG was ranked 130, and the score was uh, was 30. Uh, and uh, from last year, the, the score of the variations was just by one point, fell by one point for PNG, the Solomons, and Vanuatu, and Fiji dropped by two. Uh, uh, some people, uh, when they look at this figure, uh, they, they say, oh, Fiji is not uh, that bad. I mean, when you look at this, uh, but I take the view that uh, we are a developed nation. We are the hub of the Pacific. Uh, and uh, uh, it's important for us to uh, model ourselves on New Zealand and Australia uh, because we clearly can improve our scores. Our score can clearly go up to 60, uh, 65. So that's what uh, uh, we, we are saying, yeah? that uh, we can do much, much better than this. Uh, when you look at the Solomon Islands, uh, the gov uh, uh, one of the reasons for the, uh, the the score to come down is that the government is uh, so far is delaying elections uh, scheduled for 2023 uh, because of the they say because of the games and there had been civil unrest uh, that broke out in late 2021 uh, and uh, there were issues with uh, the China uh, that boiled over that boiled over and uh, this year in an attempt to further rest control the government began to require approval of stories in the national broadcast. Uh, basically, there was media, uh, um, repressive media, like the media is now being repressed. Uh, it's not a free media, the laws that are coming in. So those things uh, affect the CPI scores. We look at um, uh, Fiji. Uh, Fiji off offers some hope for the future, uh, the despite the warning signs about two point drop this year. Uh, in 2022, the government began attacks on the free press, uh, threatening to fine or even imprison journalists for publishing materials contrary to the public interest. Uh, but a new election law also gave supervisor, the supervisor ex extraordinary powers and limited free speech. Uh, however, the December elections produced a new coalition government, ending the, the six-year rule. Uh, and the new prime minister and government have, been, uh, have already begun to implement a 100-day plan that includes provisions to protect media freedom and Mr. Blowing. And you can see that uh, now in Parliament, uh, they are going to repeal the, the Media Act. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this trend did not hold for the entire region. Uh, despite a history of electoral strife, Papua New Guinea with a score of 30, uh, the 2023 elections is being called, called the country's worst ever. And TI Papua New Guinea uh, reports uh, found numerous irregularities with out-of-date election rolls, the stolen ballot boxes, and even bouts of violence. Uh, none of this bodes well for demo uh, democratic development in PNG and may directly affect its future CPI scores. And in Vanuatu, uh, it was a bright spot this year. Uh, the people are becoming more aware of corruption as an issue as civil society organizations form coalitions to hold government accountable. Uh, in an important win, the government committed to establish, establishing an anti-corruption commission in late 2021, uh, yet the country continues to grapple with political instability, uh, with snap elections held this year after the prospect of a no-confidence vote triggered the president to call elections in August. Uh, just some concluding remarks. 
uh, despite the difficulties facing the Pacific no. region, uh, there are many opportunities uh, that can be seen. Sorry, Mr. Lomiti. Uh, Mr. Lomiti. To recommit <laughs> to fighting corruption. Um, for example, this year, uh, the Pacific Island Forum endorsed the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific uh, continent, uh, which includes commitments to good governance and anti corruption efforts. Uh, that, uh, you probably have heard of the TE One Newer Vision. Uh, so, uh, this vision um, is part of the uh, uh, 2050 strategy of the Blue Pacific. And now, the, the important thing is to turn this into policy, uh, to take the action on it, uh, the, on that vision. Uh, so that uh, um, anti corruption uh, strategies can be uh, carried, can be enacted throughout the Pacific. Uh, that's basically my presentation uh, that, that I have. Uh, and later, when there are questions, I'll be able to answer questions. Uh, I haven't gone on the CPI uh, because that data is readily available on our transparency.org website and also on uh, our U uh, Transparency International YouTube channel. Uh, thank you so much, friends, for listening. Naka. Thank you so much, Mr. Joseph Aramo. Well, that was great and uh, a great um, presentation from his end. And uh, rather, I'd like to introduce myself as the moderator. I am uh, Naomi Pareti, a PG TV uh, producer and presenter. And I'm glad that uh, I'm able to be part of this uh, conversation, more like an Alanoa uh, session uh, on this uh, beautiful um, Tuesday. And for those that are just joining us, we we'll welcome you to this uh, webinar. And we thank you for joining us as we um, take on the um, comments, especially uh, if you have questions. We can keep those for later. And as we uh, finish and we uh, hear the concluding remarks from Mr. Maramo, we'd like to also acknowledge and welcome uh, Associate Professor Grant Walton. Professor Grant uh, works at the De Development Policy Center and the Policy and Governance Program within the Crawford School of Public Policy at the Australian National University. He's on the editorial board for the uh, journal Asian Pacific Policy Studies and the convener of the Integrity and Anti-Corruption Specialization of the uh, Crawford School's Master of Public Policy. For more than 15 years, uh, Mr. Grant has conducted research in the Pacific, particularly in Melanesia, in our Melanesian countries. Grant has also published in academic uh, journals and books and has authored major reports uh, for donors and NGOs. His book, Anti-Corruption and Its uh, Discontents, Local, National, and International Perspectives on Corruption in Papua New Guinea was published through uh, World Bank in 2018. We thank you, uh, Mr. Grant Walton, and we welcome you. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much for that, uh, for that introduction and welcome everybody to the seminar. Uh, I would first uh, like to uh, acknowledge and celebrate the Ngunnawal people on whose lands that I'm coming to you from and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So uh, I'd like to thank the, the organisers of, of today's uh, event. It's a really great opportunity to, to um, discuss with you some of the emerging research that's coming out about uh, corruption measures in uh, Fiji and in the region. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through uh, a number of different indicators to show um, a bit about what we know about the measures and solutions to corruption in Fiji, and I'll touch on some other Pacific Island countries, particularly focusing on Melanesia as I go. So by way of introduction, um, uh, in 2006, of course, the, uh, Fiji had what was named at the time the Good Governance Coup, whereby the, um, uh, th there was a, a military takeover led by uh, the previous Prime Minister, Barney Marama, took over the government and justified this coup in the name of good governance and in the name of fighting corruption, um, amongst other issues. So one of the questions that uh, we can ask, we've had an election last year which brought in a new democratically elected government in Fiji, is how far has Fiji come since that good governance coup? 
And in part of this uh, presentation, I'll be answering that question and I'll also be drawing on a variety of measures to show what we know about the nature of corruption in Fiji. I'll highlight some of the key challenges and perhaps opportunities to addressing it and then I'll conclude. So first of all, if we can get into measuring corruption, there are many ways to measure corruption and, uh, and Joseph has just done an excellent job in um, highlighting the Corruption Perceptions Index. Now, I'm not going to go through this slide all that much other than to say that the Corruption Perceptions Index is a measure of perceptions about the levels of corruption across 180 countries and it's the most popular measure. It's the most known. It gets the most media coverage. Now, uh, Fiji first um, uh, uh, and, uh, and Bani Marama in particular highlighted Fiji's score on the Corruption Perceptions Index uh, in the lead up to last year's election to say we are the party that is addressing corruption in, uh, in the nation. You can see that by this, uh, this, this fly here um, suggesting that uh, Fiji's rank on the Corruption Perceptions Index is an indicator that they were governing well and they were addressing corruption. Now, there is some. There are some measures to suggest that actually there's a there's a at least a kernel of truth to, uh, in that. Now, um, if we have a look at another measure, and this is coming from the worldwide governance indicators, this measures um, the control of corruption in uh, a range of uh, countries and far more countries in the Pacific than the Corruption Perceptions in, in, uh, Index. We see that actually the percentile rank of Fiji has improved from 2007, the year after the coup, um, from around 60 to uh, 2021, the most recent data, uh, in, in improving to 67.3. Uh, so there has been some indication that there has been um, improvement over the over the the last um, number of years during the previous government. When we compare the control of corruption score in Oceania to other Pacific countries, we see that Fiji does relatively well. It does better than countries such as Kiribati, Marshall Islands, all the way down to um, Papua New Guinea Sol and Solomon Islands. Uh, but it doesn't do as well as American Samoa, Tuvalu, Samoa and Micronesia. So it's kind of, you know, towards the upper end of, of the, 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 the median um, score there. Now, these measures that I've presented to you are mostly expert opinions, right? The, and what we need to do to get a fuller picture of what's going on in the country is to also ask citizens. Now, in 2021, there was the first Pacific Global Corruption Barometer that was undertaken. Now, this was the first attempt to statistically measure people's perceptions of corruption across the Pacific region. It included 17 countries. So when I present this data, I'm, um, and I was involved in, in, in the analysis of the smaller Pacific Island case studies, um, but this was conducted by Transparency International, um, when I present it, you can see that on the left-hand side, we have the larger Pacific Island countries, which includes Fiji, these are statistically uh, this is statistically significant results. The smaller Pacific Island case studies, they are representative, but not to the degree of the larger ones. So that's why they are separated in this analysis. So the Global Corruption Barometer found that 68% in Fiji saw that the government corruption was a big problem. Now, that wasn't as bad as uh, Solomon Islands, P PNG, um, uh, and, and Vanuatu, to name a few, um, but it was better than, um, it, was, it was not as good, sorry, as Tonga, Kiribati, Samoa and other smaller countries. 61% saw the private, sec private sector corruption as a big problem. That was not as bad as Solomon Islands and PNG with their larger, uh, particularly logging sectors um, and, and, and um, marine uh, sectors, but Fiji, um, wasn't as uh, didn't receive as good a, um, a score on that uh, response on that compared to a number of other Pacific countries, as you can see. Now, one of the things with corruption across the Pacific, what we know and, um, and and we have to be very careful about is that the difference between a gift and corruption can be blurry, right? So the Global Corruption Barometer asks some questions about reciprocity. And this is one of them. And it shows that, and, and it shows responses to the question, if helped by somebody in a position of authority, I should give them a gift or political support. 
And what we see that in um, Fiji, around a third of respondents said that they would help somebody in a position of authority if they, if they helped them out. And that was, um, uh, that was not as high as Kiribati and, and, and Vanuatu, um, but, um, uh, but um, higher than in, um, and, than in Samoa and in other Pacific countries, as, as you can see there. So it's less in, in important than some of the other um, Pacific, um, Pacific island, uh, island countries, um, particular, particularly those larger ones there. The other thing we have to keep in mind about corruption and accusations of corruption in Fiji is that corruption in Fiji doesn't just depend on people and institutions and, um, and, and, and actors within Fiji itself. Corruption is transnational in nature. It ducks and weaves and moves across national boundaries, across subnational boundaries. Uh, it, it, the proceeds of corruption end up in places like uh, Australia, Singapore, the United States and other places. And to capture this, this table shows the Trans Justice Network's Financial Security in, uh, Secrecy Index, sorry. And it shows across the world when it comes to hiding illicitly gained money, the United States is the worst country in the world, right? Uh, so oftentimes when we think about corruption, the Corruption Perceptions Index, we think about these developing countries being the problem. This is a different way of seeing the issue. So we see that the United States is the worst in the world. Singapore is pretty bad. Um, we also have countries like China, Australia and Malaysia uh, where in particular um, illicitly gained money in, uh, from the Pacific goes to. When we have a look at Fiji on this list, it's actually ranked fairly well. It's, um, it's better than, um, than Australia and, and uh, New Zealand. So we need to keep that in mind in terms of understanding the, the, the kind of the, the broader picture of corruption in Fiji. So I want to now just highlight some of the challenges to addressing corruption in, um, in Fiji. And this is drawing on um, some of the research that I've been um, involved in with Husni Hoshang and Nilesh Gounder as well. So I'd like to thank them for, the, for their help. But first, let's go back to this global corruption barometer. Now, it, it's actually um, uh, some, there's some good results in this global corruption barometer. We found that 57% uh, of, of respondents were optimistic about government efforts to fight corruption. And when we asked people if they thought they could make a difference in the fight against corruption, over 80% of people said that, that, um, that they um, thought that they could, that ordinary people could make a difference. So that's quite good. However, only one fifth of respondents believe that corrupt officials are punished. And this is an area of weakness across the Pacific. People do not believe, most people do not believe that those who engage in corruption face sanctions for their actions. Now, there are many reasons for this, but a part of the reason is um, due to the nature of the integrity agencies, agencies like the Ombudsman, like the police, well, in the case of Vanuatu, like the, the Fiji ICAC, like the police, like the Auditor General and other integrity agencies. Now, if we start with the police, we actually see that there have been increases in spending and promise spending um, over the, for, for more than a decade. So just to read this graph, we have the blue line, which is what the government promised to deliver to the police and to other institutions. And the red line is what they actually received. And you can see that there's a gap. There's a gap between these lines, which means that these agencies, the police here, did not receive what they were initially promised. And, and this is um, a bit of a concern and something that we have been monitoring. Uh, so, but you have you see that the, in terms of spending, there has been an increase. However, the police is a concern because in the global corruption barometer, uh, the police and uh, MPs, as well as um, as as business executives, were were the um, institutions that were most associated with corruption. So, there's a, a concern there about um, uh, corruption within the police. Uh, the Office of the Auditor General, when we have a look at how much um, funding it gets, there has been an increase, but there are also these underspends. So the agency is getting less than, uh, than what it has been um, promised um, there. 
So you can see the, the gap. The Attorney General's Office, we also um, see re reductions um, in, in funding and large underspends. And now I want to get to the FICAC, the Fiji Independent Commission Against Corruption, which is the key anti-corruption agency in Fiji. And that agency was set up in 2007 in response to uh, the government's promise to clean up corruption as to justify its taking over of the democratically elected government. Now, we can see that in terms of spending from 2010, spending reduced from uh, 10.6 uh, million Fijian dollars down to 8 million Fijian Fijian dollars. Now, these figures have been adjusted for inflation, so they are comparable over time. So there is some concerns there. There has been uh, some underspend also um, that's of concern for, for this agency. Now, there's been some debate about the Fiji ICAC. Uh, and in the lead up to last year's election, the opposition at the time said that it would abolish the ICAC um, after 100 days. It doesn't look like it's happening as, as far as I'm aware at the moment, but there's certainly been some criticism against it. Now, um, I'd like to say that, that it's important to note that whilst the Fiji ICAC was connected to, um, to the Barney Marama government, uh, that there have been some advantages to having a, a, an ICAC set, set up. Um, over time, there's been a significant increase in complaints to the, um, to the agency. In 2017-18, there was about 3,000 complaints. I think the year before, it was even more, around about 5,000. So um, initially, there were a few complaints, less, you know, around about uh, 100 to 200 complaints per year, and it's, that's shot up. And it's relatively well-funded. And to give you an indication, Whilst there have been reductions, in Papua New Guinea, for its key in, um, anti corruption um, agencies, about four or five of them, the government spends about 0.27% of, um, of its budget on, those, on all of those agencies. In Fiji, the ICAC itself um, is promised to receive um, a, about that amount, um, about 0.28% uh, in the 2023, 2000 and, and um, two, sorry, 2022, 2023 budget. So it's relatively, when we compare it to say PNG, uh, well funded. Um, but yes, there have been accusations of political interference and, and a lack of independence and that has to be addressed. Um, and, uh, um, and there is another issue that it does not investigate the majority of complaints. And uh, I was involved uh, with, with others uh, in analysing the uh, complaints that the Fiji ICAC got between 2007 and 2014. We found that about 5% of reports fell under its, um, its, its mandate, uh, and that had been dropping over time. The other thing that we found with our analysis is, is that... Um, there's a gender dimension to responding to corruption um, in, in Fiji. So females are far more less, uh, far less likely to complain to the Fiji ICAC um, than, uh, than, than men are. So in 2020, 2014, 25 percent of, of complaints were from females, and that was that was that improved since 2007, but still far fewer than men. Uh, women are far more likely to, to complain about the family. Um, as well as uh, the state and the private sector. Uh, the Global Corruption Barometer found that 11% of women, uh, sorry, 11% of respondents, I should say, experienced extortion or knew someone who had. And this points to the idea that we need to better understand the gender dimensions of corruption and how uh, women in particular can respond meaningfully to it. The analysis also showed that in terms of defining corruption, there was a mismatch between um, uh, the, uh, the way that the FICAC defined corruption and complainants, with most complainants having a broader definition of corruption than FICAC, and that led to a kind of a, um, a misalignment between what was reported and uh, what fell under FICAC's mandate. In terms of anti-money laundering efforts in general, um, this is a report that was put out by Transparency International last year. Uh, in general, it found that Fiji has sufficient preventative measures based upon a sound legal framework, framework, but money laundering investigation, prosecution, and recovery of corruption proceeds has not been actively pursued. 
Um, and the report uh, highlighted concerns about banking, real estate and foreign exchange sectors hiding funds from narco trafficking, corruption and tax evasion. And, and certainly there have been concerns with uh, organisations like bikey gangs uh, becoming more prominent in Fiji. There's also, as and this is uh, the final slide before I, I wrap up, uh, there's also an opportunity for regional leadership. The Tioina vision, as Joseph mentioned, um, provides the region with an opportunity to contribute to um, more meaningful responses. The Tioina vision was um, a, a, an agreement by Pacific Island leaders and has been endorsed by the Pacific Islands Forum um, as a, a, an important statement of intent to fight corruption across the region. There have been suggestions that uh, that uh, we might uh, that the re region might look at setting up a, a Pacific Centre for financial crime, um, but there's certainly uh, it's certainly important that uh, that not only Fiji steps up into this into this um, regional space, but others do as well. Um, and I'm thinking um, in particular about Australia because Australia has a terrible reputation uh, for facilitating money laundering. It's starting to, over the last few years, respond to, uh, to these uh, allegations uh, and uh, particularly within the casino industry, but it has been criticised for ages for um, having a poor anti-money laundering response. There's been a Senate standing committee that's provided some recommendations. It should be looking at doing that and also cooperating more with um, its Pacific partners. So if you want to uh, address corruption in Fiji, it's not just about people, institutions within Fiji, it needs um, uh, metropolitan countries, Australia, New Zealand and others to also step up. Okay, I just want to conclude very um, briefly. There have been improvements in terms of responding to corruption uh, in Fiji, and we can we can highlight some of those from the um, from the analysis that the the increased analysis that's been done over the, the past few years. But corruption is still a serious challenge. Uh, I think we need to keep and, and, and reform the FICAC uh, and also support other integrity agencies. There, uh, in the constitution, there um, is um, a provision for an accountability and transparency commission that also could help to, um, to, to take some of the load off the, off the FICAC. Um, but uh, the other thing that I'd like to highlight is the importance of understanding some of the informal institutions around um, understandings of corruption and responding to it. And there is a need in Fiji and across the Pacific to really explore, explore alternative responses. I think too often we rely on focusing on these formal institutions, on the fight, on the uh, ICACs, uh, on the um, uh, integrity agencies. And what we need to be doing is having a look at how people understand corruption and, and are involved in addressing it in their everyday, um, everyday lives. There is a need for a greater focus on the gender dimensions of um, the way in which people experience corruption and also are able to, um, to uh, report it. Uh, there is uh, an it's important that people are aware about the role of integrity and anti-corruption agencies. And finally, there's this, there's this moment right now uh, which has not been there for a long time. If you look back to, say, 15 years ago, the anti-corruption good governance agenda was really something that was pushed onto the Pacific by donors, donors like Australia, donors like New Zealand and, and uh, multilateral agencies. Now we're seeing a Pacific response through the Tiawina vision, through the Pacific Islands Forum um, and other kinds of engagements. And I think that uh, there is an opportunity to build on that. Uh, and that will, in, that will involve Pacific leaders uh, like, the, like Fiji that play an important regional role, but also, uh, countries like Australia cleaning up their backyard and making sure that uh, you know illicit funding doesn't easily so easily flow into those countries. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for that, and happy to answer any questions you might have or um, continue the, the conversation over email or or, uh, or what have you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Mr. Walton. That was very insightful, and it's so great to hear that we have a lot of women in our managing countries. May I uh, pose a question to you, Grant, at the moment, um, especially with uh, our participants that are joining us. Um, someone would love to ask, uh, what was your measure 
in the uh, graphic comparison between now Melanesian countries. What was the measure? Yeah, what was the measure in the graphic comparison between the, uh, the between the countries? Okay, I, I'm I'm not sure which which one, but let me let me go back if I can just share, share my slide. Um, I'll, I've got a number of in here, but let me just uh, this is this one here is the control of corruption measure. Now this is a, a, a survey of surveys. So this draws upon different surveys of, of corruption, including perceptions of bribery um, and other measures of, of corruption um, across the world. So this is a, a global um, analysis that is a part of the worldwide governance indicators. And look, the other thing that I drew on quite a lot was the global corruption barometer. Now the global corruption barometer is the uh, um, was rolled out across the Pacific in 2021. It was rolled out across 17 countries. I think there was about 7,000 people in total that were that, that were interviewed. Um, very large sample sizes, anyway. And and this provides a reference point for understanding public perceptions of corruption. And we haven't done a lot of this work in the Pacific. Uh, so it provides us with um, with um, uh, hope uh, with with a point of of comparison. So you can see here that uh, um, that uh, in terms of who sees government as a um, government corruption as a big problem. Look, Solomon Islands and PNG, as you might expect, you know people are really concerned about government corruption in in those uh, countries. If we're looking at Melanesian countries, um, Vanuatu is just over seventy percent, close to close to Fiji. Uh, but then we get less of a concern in other countries uh, across the Pacific, particularly those smaller ones here. Um, so yeah, that's just a, a bit of an indication about the, the measures that I'm drawing on, but happy to answer any more questions around that, that methodology. Thank you so much, Mr. Walton, for that. And, um, and just on that note, what is um, what actually makes up the so-called um, the, the clean countries that, that uh, you mentioned? Just uh, facilitating and you know hiding all this dirty money and all these transactions that are that are happening in our Malaysian counterparts. So, so you know, in terms of money laundering, this is where uh, this is where we get a different picture of where the nature of the problem lies. And and so, uh, if I sorry, I'm just going to share my screen again. I hope you don't mind. But um, but if we go down to this this uh, this table here. Um, what this does is it is it um, is it provides an alternative view on um, the, where the problem is in terms of corruption. The corruption perceptions index provides us with one perception, uh, one perspective. What the corruption perceptions index does is it shows us where the um, the transactions are perceived to be happening, and it focuses on the national scale. So, so it compares one country to another country. But when we look at where the money ends up, where does that corrupt money go? Where we see it going is into mostly more developed countries. Uh, the United States is shockingly bad in terms of hiding money. They've got industries in some states um, that are set up to provide um, uh, secretive bank accounts for people and um, uh, and shell companies for people to hide their money in. And so this provides a different kind of um, perspective on, on the nature of the problem. It's still important to address corruption within Fiji, look at the FICAC and look at other measures um, to address corruption in the country. Um, but this just shows that the corruption that goes on in Fiji is not just you know, the responsibility of Fiji. We, lived in a, we live in a globalised world and we need to have a look at the interconnections and enabling corruption. Thank you so much, Grant, for that. And uh, I know it's very inspirational uh, just having a listen. Mr. Ramo, I hope I'd be able to also, uh, what are your perspectives, what are your opinions on that, especially regarding Fiji? I guess Mr. Ramo would be uh, able to uh, also have us have a listen to his opinion. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Grant uh, has clearly explained uh, uh, the case for Fiji. 
uh, and I think that's fantastic. Uh, that, so I, I, I thought that was a, a great uh, work that he's done. Uh, as I mentioned in the CPI, um, uh, because there was a lapse of 17 years uh, from 2006 to 2021, uh, there was a lapse. Uh, the, 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 the CPI could not uh, give a statistically significant uh, figure for that, but I like the way Grant did it, uh, where he showed the, the, the range uh, of scores from 2007 in one of his slides. Uh, so I thought that it was great. Um, uh, I, I suppose uh, we, we should all work together uh, to try and bring corruption down and work to make uh, FICAC more independent. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Varam for that. And uh, it's so great to hear ideas, especially from the different perspectives and the different opinions. Just another question, if I may pose to um, two gentlemen. Uh, the trans transnational dimension uh, shows that the Pacific is on the lower scale com compared to our founders. Huh? Um, how do we capture alternative natures of this fund, uh, if you say that? So, Joseph, do you mind if I go first? Sure. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So, so look, um, there are a number of things that Australia needs to be doing in particular. And I'm going to talk about Australia because I'm from Australia. And I think Australia has been criticised for a long time for its poor response to transnational corruption. Um, and so um, it is starting to, admittedly, Australia has introduced legislation to start to uh, address some of these concerns. Uh, it has... Um, started to look at its casinos, which is a, a, a major source of money laundering, um, uh, but it needs to do more, particularly in the real estate sector. So uh, we've got uh, in Australia, in uh, Queensland, a, um, uh, a, 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 the, a, a real estate area which is called the Cairns Colony, whereby we know that Pacific Island um, uh, money is being spent on real estate. We know who who owns the real estate in some cases, and we um, and and a lot of the uh, um, re this real estate has been in the past um, purchased without any questions asked. Our banks uh, have been involved in um, a number of money laundering scandals over the years and have been very been basically slapped on the wrist. Uh, in one case, if they, were, uh, my understanding is that if they, if if the bank involved was actually fined the money that it was meant to be fined for money for for, for um, facilitating um, uh, money laundering transactions, it would have it would have been bankrupt. Uh, but the regulator didn't do that. So there's more that Australia um, Australia certainly um, can do. And this is not to take away from the, the task of addressing, you know, of, of supporting the FICAC, of, of doing things within Fiji, uh, supporting civil society, uh, uh, institutions like Transparency International um, to address corruption within the country. But there needs to be a greater network looking at and, and responding to this. Uh, and, and yes, as the, as the question notes, the donors have been pushing this good governance agenda for uh, a number of years, and that's a kind of you know it's been relatively positive. But we they also have to look at their own backyard. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. If I may, if I may just briefly uh, respond, uh, I think uh, money laundering uh, and transnational uh, crimes are a huge issue in uh, the Pacific. And I believe that it, this is not adequately covered in the CPI uh, because the CPI just looks at the national uh, aspects and compares it to within countries. Uh, I think one of the ways of doing this is to uh, uh, have beneficiary uh, like uh, the, uh, the company's registrar's office like in Fiji. Uh, when overseas companies uh, register their companies, uh, there should be a clear law on beneficiary ownership uh, so we know who actually owns that company uh, overseas, uh, because in the case of uh, Mr. Putin's uh, super yacht, uh, we just found out a couple of months ago that it was registered uh, uh, in the Marshall Islands, in one of these uh, offshore accounts, the Marshall Islands. Uh, so uh, those are some things that we need to look at. Uh, 
Um, I, I apologize, I don't have all the figures on this, but I just want to flag here that money laundering is a huge issue. Uh, and it's something that um, uh, Transparency International and uh, uh, other the CSOs and government should work together to, to look at and tackle uh, in this. And one of the things I like about this, uh, um, this Zoom, this webinar, is that uh, international idea is sort of taking the lead in this, and which is just fantastic uh, for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, gentlemen, and uh, the views and perspectives that uh, we're hearing. Uh, I know will enlighten many of us. And uh, we'd also like to uh, just uh, pose another question to Mr. Grant, uh, because it is, uh, it is where many questions arise, especially with these topics. Just a question, uh, Mr. Walton. Uh, what do you think about the idea of setting up a Pacific Ombudsman that is housed under the great uh, PI framework? And uh, just in addition to that, in asking this question, uh, we're also mindful, I'm also mindful of the issues of sovereignty and non-interference. This is a question that has been uh, posed to us uh, by um, our participants that are joining us uh, on this um, webinar. Thank, thank you for, uh, for for the question and and thanks Teddy. Uh, I know Teddy Wynn, he's doing some excellent research in Papua New Guinea. So uh, hi, hi Teddy. Look, um, I think I would be hesitant at this moment in terms of setting up new formal institutions. I think that there could be more work that's been done to, um, to, to, to facilitate greater networks between existing national um, institutions. I, I, look, um, I, I I think that over time it could be possible to 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 develop some regional institutions, but I I just feel that right now we are introducing these new anti-corruption organisations uh, and Papua New Guinea and Fiji have been, sorry Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands have introduced the um the, their their independent commissions against corruption we've got other countries like samoa promising to 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 um do something similar although not an actual icac and i just think that um setting up those national organizations should be a priority supporting them uh, providing a network of, of exchange between different country organizations so something a bit more informal i think first uh, then perhaps over time developing um, some of the potential infrastructure. Um, but certainly, you know, something like a Pacific Financial Crime Centre, um, which involves agencies from a, no a number of different countries looking at that transnational dimension, I think could be a, a valuable idea. Um, so maybe a, a formal ombudsman, you know, um, in the medium term, but in the short term, I think, you know, more kind of, um, you know, networked hubs that are looking at issues like transnational crime and supporting these new anti-corruption agencies that have been set up in countries. One of the big fear I, fears I have, I think this is less likely in Fiji, but certainly in PNG and Solomon Islands uh, and in, you know, say, say somebody somewhere like uh, perhaps um, Samoa, um, is that these new agencies will be created and they'll fall over. And that would be um, a real disaster in terms of um, people's uh, view of the government and um, the importance of addressing corruption in these countries. So I think that there's really a need now for a regional, regional support for these new organisations that are being set up as the first priority. Thanks, Teddy, for your question. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Grant. Uh, Mr. Ramo, would you like to uh, just add on to what Mr. Walton has shared? That uh, question, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and it's okay. Grant uh, uh, has uh, answered that well. Uh, I was going to say something on the next question there uh, on the media. Uh, yeah, Wait, the next question. Yeah, uh, professor, yeah. is the media releasing corruption news to the people? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that. Um, uh, uh, now that the uh, the media act is going to be. Uh, uh, the, the, the removed, uh, uh, hopefully the, the media will be a bit more open in exposing uh, uh, corruption news and so forth. I, I think that'd be, uh, be important. Uh, for us at uh, Integrity Fiji, uh, we are um, uh, 
uh, created to transparency national we sort of felt that we just had to be courageous uh, in the Bainimarama government, uh, but I think it also calls for the media to be courageous and to, uh, to expose things. Uh, so that is basically our take on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramo. Mr. Walter, what are your views on, uh, from the uh, region's uh, perspective? On, on, the on the media question? Um, yeah, look, I, I, I mean, I think uh, Joseph's a far you know, better expert on, on, on this than I am. I, I mean, I will just say, though, that I think that, um, that social media has been a, a really important um, development in, you know, across the region, in, particularly in, in Fiji, uh, Solomon Islands, um, PNG. And, and there is this, this balance that's, that's happening. I mean, traditional media is really important because it's got much greater credibility. But, but social media is um, pressuring um, political elites to respond to accusations, even if they might, might be unfounded. So I think that, um, that, and there are a number of different, uh, you know, Facebook pages and things like that that have been set up um, where, you know, there, there are journalists that are, um, that are curating the content. And that's, I think, a really good um, trend, and I hope to see some more um, credible kind of um, sites that are coming up sharing information about corruption and things like that. I think that's a potential game changer, although there are obviously risks with, with around social media, fake news and these types of things, but I think that's an important component as well. Thanks. My apologies. Pamela has um, posed a question uh, for Professor Walton, especially with uh, in our country here in Fiji with FICA. Has there any research or have you researched into the performance of the individual commissioners? If they were Fiji locals or expatriates, and whether that should be a lesson for the Pacific Island uh, in regards to this? Look, we we haven't done research on the commissioners themselves. We've been tracking funding and we've been looking at, you know, the global corruption barometer score and um, you know, some of the indicators of performance of, of the FICAC. And we haven't linked that to um, the commissioners per se. But there is a um, there is a broader question that I think that the, the, the questioner is alluding to across the Pacific, and that is the role that foreigners can play in heading up these um, uh, independent commissions against corruption and also the, um, the judiciary. And we've seen, you know, you know um, uh, high level judges from uh, New Zealand and Australia uh, caught up in some controversies, uh, you know, particularly in, in places like Kiribati. Um, but in Papua New Guinea, they've just announced that they will, there will be two commissioners from Australia and one from New Zealand heading up their anti-corruption commission. And that has been justified on the basis that, you know, somebody within Papua New Guinea has got too many links. I personally um, prefer a, um, look, I, I, I think it's it's a fraught space. I personally would prefer to see um, uh, citizens from within the country take these these positions, or at least there be a kind of a time frame to ensure that if um, if foreigners are heading up these these anti corruption commissions or or the judiciary, you know, in senior um, uh, spots of the judiciary, that there is a um, an opportunity to hand over to um, uh, and, and to train up and to make sure that, that, that this is not the, the status quo to, con to continue on. Uh, so I, look, I, I uh, would personally like to see far more um, Pacific involvement. I understand the, 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 um, the uh, rationale behind it, uh, but I think that there are a number of instances that we can point to where Pacific leadership has, you know, been at the top of these anti-corruption agencies and it has met with success. I, I won't comment on Fiji in particular, but I will say um, if we have a look at Task Force Sweep in, in Papua New Guinea, which was a clear, successful anti-corruption agency that was set up and, um, and was briefly very successful, headed up by a dynamic Papua New Guinean leader. And I think that that uh, has some lessons for other agencies across the Pacific. Thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Mr. Walton.
Um, thanks, uh, Elena, here for your question. I'd like to pose to uh, Mr. Maramo. How does uh, geopolitics link to this corruption? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I, I wanted to um, respond to that question also. Uh, in Fiji, we have had uh, two commissioners, uh, Colonel Langman, and then after Colonel Langman, uh, Rashmi Aslam uh, is coming in. He's the current one. And uh, we work closely uh, with uh, Mr. Aslam, and uh, he's now a Fiji citizen. Uh, he is always very open uh, to ideas and uh, would welcome any Zoom to answer any questions that people have. Um, I take the view that uh, when we uh, advertise these positions, we should always get the best person for this. Uh, while we want a local, uh, it often happens that the person from overseas uh, uh, they can deliver a, a better job on it. Uh, at the end of the day, to me, it's about merit. Uh, and uh, I know people may not agree with me this. Uh, I, I feel also in the rugby field, if the coach from overseas is better, let's use the guy or, or woman on that. Eh? Uh, so it doesn't really matter to me whether it's somebody is from a local or overseas, so long as the job gets done. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Laka. Thank you so much. Uh, good stuff from gentlemen, especially with uh, the views in Fiji and also from within the region, from Mr. Walter. Um, if I may also uh, continue, um, just another question. What is the reason behind Fiji's uh, performance, especially when compared to our Melanesian uh, countries? Fiji is uh, above the 50% mark compared to the others. Yeah, I, I, I take the view that uh, we shouldn't be, what's the word for it, uh, too smug in Fiji. Uh, I think uh, we can do much better than that, the score. Uh, we really should be looking to uh, New Zealand and, uh, uh, and Australia as role models uh, to improve our scores. Uh, but I'd rather not uh, make any comments about uh, other Malaysian countries. Perhaps Grant may, uh, may like to comment. Naka. Thank you, Mr. Ram. Mr. Walton, would you like to just add on a bit? Thank you. I think I feel like I've been put on the spot, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, I um, look. I think that uh, Fiji is doing relatively well when you have a, a look at how it's um, how it's going, uh, and and we can we know that from a number of measures. We have to be careful, I think, about just taking one measure. But um, you know, if you have a look at the the results from the Global Corruption Barometer, you have a look at um, other other scores. I think that uh, there are lessons to be learned, not just from other Melanesian countries, which, you know, if you have a look at Fiji in terms of other Melanesian countries, it's leading the pack. It, 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 it is doing, um, doing relatively well. I think Fiji should be looking at, um, at, at uh, across the whole Pacific. Um, and there are other countries that do um, that in terms of the corruption um, barometer in terms of the um, uh, the control of corruption indicator that do better, and so I think that you know having a look at um, some of these other countries that are smaller than Fiji and kind of learning some of the lessons from that would also uh, would also help. Look, I am of the view that it, look Australia and New Zealand are while they are islands, I think that they're somewhat unique. There's a you know there's a, a, a different history. Um, uh, and and uh, you know different so uh, society cultural issues those those types of things um, and so I think that yes some aspects um, of uh, Fiji's response can be learnt from from Australia and and um, and, and New Zealand I agree with uh, Joseph on that but I also think there's some there's some um, there's some things to be learned from other Pacific Island countries particularly the way in which culture is drawn upon the the relationship between you know um, cultural and societal obligations and these formal institutions I think there's some more learning to be done there and I would say uh, as an academic there's probably more research to be done there's a lot that we don't understand thank you thank you uh, explanation on that with that being said uh, Mr Walter do you think uh, that having institutions like uh, the Fiji Independent Commission against corruption, which is fully functional compared to other Malaysian countries, uh, which is finding it hard to operate, especially affected behind Fiji's performance? So is that, a, I think that's a question about whether or not um, the, the, the FICAC, you know, what, what role the, the FICAC should play. 
Look, I think that there's a really, um, you know, it's a really important moment now. We've just had the election. The the opposition have been very critical about the FICAC and there is a, um, a determination to reform it. And I think that's great. The thing that needs to happen now, I think, is that there needs to be some sort of greater independent oversight of the FICAC. It needs to be removed from um, government influence. And um, and uh, and I think a review of the of the FICAC is is absolutely absolutely necessary. Other other um, the the great thing about the FICAC is actually it stood the test of time. It's a it's an it's a it's a it's an anti corruption agency in the Pacific that's lasted for um, for more than ten years. So what have we got? Sixteen years, about 15, 16 years now. Uh, and, and that's a success story in and of itself. You know, there have been some issues with, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, attacking the opposition and things like that. And I think that very important issues to address. Uh, it, there is reform required, but uh, I think also we should not throw the baby out with the bathwater. We should keep the fire cag, and we should be looking at reforming it, making it far more independent, and also increasing it re its resources. I think its resources could be increased, and I think um, other agencies could be supported to take some of the weight off of its shoulders. Yeah. Thank you, Grant. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Ramo. What are your views on that? Uh, uh, yes, um, I, I, I think Grant uh, has uh, explained it very clearly. I don't have anything to add on that particular one. Eh? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, well, Edward has posed the question. To keep China away from Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, and US is handing out direct budget support to support our military and many others. In your opinion, is this a form of bribery? First of all, gentlemen. I'll start off first. Uh, I... <laughs> I personally don't think it's uh, for bribery. Uh, it's a way, uh, this has always happened where they give assistance uh, to countries to support them. Um, I could be uh, the way that uh, uh, Western countries give aid uh, uh, to the Pacific tends to be uh, in terms of uh, uh, strengthening democracy, uh, uh, gender, gender issues, human rights. Uh, and that sort of links to the next question because uh, a survey has been done of all the countries in the CPI, all 180 countries, and it was found that uh, those countries with, uh, uh, with a, a poor dem democratic institutions, uh, uh, low democracy, are the ones who do poorly in the CPI, so that, that is that. Uh, we should also be mindful that with China, uh, they are quite popular in the Pacific, especially Melanesian countries, because they fund... Uh, uh, they, they fund uh, infrastructure and things that people uh, uh, re require, especially rural people. Uh, so so that, that there's, um, uh, that there's always these tensions be be between this because we want uh, funding for uh, strengthening democracy. Uh, and at the other end, uh, we also want this infrastructure funding. Uh, but I don't take the view that it's, um, uh, it's bribery. I, I think one Chinese uh, uh, diplomat told me I'm not sure whether he was being sarcastic. He said that, uh, yeah, it's very well to fund uh, uh, all these things, uh, uh, agenda issues and things. But at the end of the day, uh, the people who are LGBT or, or, or gender or whatever will want a job. They'll want good roads and so forth. So they, I suppose there's a balance. Yeah? But I don't think it's a full bribery. Uh, it's for the countries in the Pacific to manage the relationship uh, with uh, uh, China and Western countries and uh, come up with... Uh, uh, sort of a, a, a path that uh, uh, can benefit uh, these countries. Naka. Naka, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Over to you, Mr. Walton. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, look, uh, I don't I agree with Joseph. I don't see it as a form of bribery. It's certainly type of influence, though. And, uh, and, and you know, Australia, New Zealand and, and China are all kind of fighting for influence and, and uh, being a Pacific Island country has has, has never been uh, more advantageous uh, as as to right now because you've got uh, you've got these superpowers fighting um, over your support. Um, now, one of the things though that that uh, is a, one of the things about budget support. So, budget support there are two types of way, two main ways that um, donors can support. Um, countries. One is through setting up projects, so direct project support, and, we, and that's been the dominant form of aid for now, you know, 20 years or so. Uh, no, more than 20 years, 20, 30 years. 
Uh, and the other is budget support. Now, budget support is giving money to a government to their budget, right? And so it's 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 there is less control that that the donors have over that funding. That form of assistance ramped up during COVID nineteen across the Pacific. So um, there is, I think, a great unspoken concern um, that that funding. Uh, because it's subject to less oversight, is more. Um, it's 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 got the greater potential for corruption, right? So there is an issue there about how that money is used for budget support, which we've seen increase since you know the, the COVID nineteen support packages coming from Australia, uh, in particular, and, and and New Zealand and others. So yeah, I I don't see it as a bribery per se, but I do think that it's 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 more likely to be used for corruption, is from what I understand of it. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. And just um, linking it to the uh, the uh, explanation of the um, this from Teddy yeah, from the new PNG ICAC, which has three commissioners appointed. Uh, the commissioner is to uh, adapt his white expatriates. Well, the idea, according to uh, Prime Minister Marape, is to avoid issues of political interference and other such uh, encroachments that have been plaguing other anti-corruption bodies for a very long time. Just uh, having your views on that, and especially with the uh, other question that's uh, also been posed um, from uh, you gentlemen. If uh, you'd like to add on, Mr. Walter. Look, I, as I said before, I understand the, the rationale for it. The idea is um, to have commissioners that are not likely to be influenced, politically influenced or, you know, influenced by cultural obligations and, and other things. Uh, I am uh, very hesitant to support it. However, I, I think that perhaps if this is a short-term agenda to get the, the ICAC set up in PNG where it could fall over um, and, and to, to have that as a short-term measure, I think that it, 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 it is, has the potential to be uh, okay, but I think there should be plans to, after a certain number of years, to, to um, have, uh, even if it's not all the commissioners, at least one commissioner uh, from PNG. And I think that that's the, that should be the case too for other Pacific countries. But Joseph, did you have a view on that? Uh, sorry, you know, I, I, I did. I, I'm, I'll pass that one. I, I don't have uh, much knowledge of PNG. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Ramo, Mr. Walton. It's uh, great uh, hearing your ideas and your perspectives, especially of this being uh, um, uh, happenings in our Melanesian countries. Uh, just to wrap up things, would you like to have the last comments from the two of you, please? Yeah, I would like to thank uh, International Idea for um, uh, for having uh, having this webinar. I, I think uh, it's a, it, we need to be talking about these things, uh, and hopefully in the next one we could invite uh, uh, some of the commissioners from the Pacific, uh, maybe uh, the FICAC one and uh, Papua New Guinea to be also part of the uh, of the webinar. But I think it's a fantastic idea. I would like to thank also uh, all the, those listening in, and especially the crowd from uh, the Fiji National University uh, that, that are also uh, listening here. Um, and uh, it's also great for our work. I think any publicity on um, anti corruption advocacy is great uh, uh, for us. Uh, and I've only, we've always said this that uh, uh, anti corruption is not just the, uh, the purview or area of Transparency National, it's for everybody, uh, other CSOs, uh, because. Um, uh, uh, Whatever we do, there is always an element of corruption, and anti-corruption work should be integrated into whatever we do, whether it's in gender, climate change, poverty alleviation, or any of those. And I'm so glad to mention here that the Fiji National University uh, is offering a degree-level course uh, in anti-corruption, uh, a new one with uh, Transparency National and Integrity in Fiji, and we are deeply grateful for that. Um, and uh, I'm so glad that you also meet Grant because Grant uh, uh, produced uh, this report of, um, of corruption in seven Pacific countries, uh, which is being used a lot. Uh, we are using that a lot in our studies at the university. And I, uh, I just found out from our young people who are going to the Auckland Pacific Governance uh, Program that they will also use that study apart from the GCP. Uh, yeah, you probably noticed from the way I'm talking that I was a former school teacher. Uh, we can do top, stop, uh, go on talking and talking. So I think I'll stop there. Yunaka, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Ramo. Just your last views, Mr. Walton. 
Yeah, Benaka. Uh, so thank you for everybody for, for attending. Thank you for IDEA and for the participants, uh, for, for, um, uh, for Joseph, for your uh, excellent views on um, the corruption perceptions of the and also the kind of in-depth perspective on Fiji. Uh, just, just finally, I'd say, look, there, there are some, there's a question around um, the characteristics of corruption, of, of, of countries with, with high corruption from, from Vicky. Vicky, I would uh, say that in the Pacific, we're seeing that most people are concerned about politicians in terms of corruption. There are some variations in Fiji. We've got police and politicians. The police and politicians are generally the um, the groups that are that are of most concern uh, in terms of the overall level of corruption in the Pacific versus other places in the world. Uh, you know, in the smaller countries, in Fiji, it's not as bad as some of the other countries, particularly those in Africa. Um, you know, places like Afghanistan and others. Um, but there are reports that you can see, uh, and um, and if you would like any of those reports, please email me. Um, but uh, yes, overall, look, I think that for Fiji, I just want to reiterate that it, I feel like it's and and the Pacific in Fiji and the Pacific, we're at a critical juncture, and there we are, there is an amazing leadership in response to this issue in Fiji and across the, the Pacific. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, the, the work that a number of people are doing, like Joseph, like others, like IDEA, um, is, is, is great in, in um, steering this and, and, and ensuring that it's a Pacific-led response. And I think we should keep that, um, uh, keep that momentum going. And if, look, if I can help, I am happy to. But uh, yeah, it's great to see that uh, Pacific leaders at the forefront. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, uh, for my colleagues here at the International Idea and the, the Asian Pacific Regional Office. We'd like to thank you both for your participation and the insightful uh, advice that we received today, especially to the audience for joining us live uh, on this event. We hope that through the discussions, we'll be able to have more people that have gained knowledge and especially share issues about Fiji and the region. From our international idea colleagues here in Fiji, we wish you well and we hope you have a blessed day. Until the next uh, webinar, Mwadamanda. Thank you very much. Thank you.